So this is chapter 6, titled Living by Faith. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Living for Christ in a complacent world is much harder than dying for him in a cruel and hostile environment. At the least, the early Christians knew what they were up against. It was a straightforward question of choice. Do you pay homage to the image of Caesar and worship him as a god, or do you stand by your belief that you will serve no other god but Jesus? Simple, though painful choice, worship the emperor and be in with the crowd or worship a crucified criminal who you claim still lives and lose your life in a most horrendous way the choice is blurred today christianity may not be a popular choice among the population at large but it is not regarded as a threat to the cohesion of the civil society even those who do not want a relationship with the risen lord still regard themselves as being Christians rather than Muslims or Hindus. If you can do your job well and be an asset to your company, nobody is going to care whether you are religious or not. What all this apathy boils down to is that it may cause you to lose your edge. You stand for nothing except perhaps only what you stand against. The average Christian in the West at least falls into a routine of church programs. Don't get me wrong, there is absolutely nothing wrong with church activities. Even those who set out to have a ministry outside the framework of the church eventually run the same risk of falling into some routine. It could be a prayer and counseling ministry, intercessory ministry, marriage counseling, or charity work. Eventually, every form of ministry ends up in a rut. That is the nature of every human endeavor. The captain. What sets apart a Gilgal inspired church program or parachurch ministry is the person in charge. To throw more light on that concept, we need to go to the book of Joshua. There lies a great lesson for us. Uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 14 says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and beheld, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to meet him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Before Joshua could march round Jericho or change, strategy regarding the battle of Ai, he had to come face to face with the commander of the army of the Lord. If, if the powers that be are not engaged in battle, Joshua's war in Canaan would amount to nothing. He would be fighting a physical battle whereas the real battle was a spiritual one. Definitely no one can fight a spiritual battle just by praying a lot or conducting numerous programs. People who attend may enjoy the message, be blessed by the ministry, feel uplifted by the worship, yet achieve little in the spiritual realm. The enemy that refuses to engage and yet would not surrender is a very difficult tar target. That is why as a church we are stuck in the 21st century. Our worship is more geared in to us enjoying it. Our preaching is dealing mostly with material things and happiness issues. We try to be up to speed on the latest technology and multimedia presentations, but the world continues to go further and further away from biblical principles. We have gender issues, race issues, poverty issues, inequality issues, climate change issues, conflicts, and wars. Christian Christians try to engage in all these world issues, yet the church does not have the upper hand. We are not winning, though we are active and vocal and prayerful. So what is missing? We have lost 
touch with the captain. Each of us, or each and every one of us, has lost touch. A team is as good as its individual players. Every believer, not just the top layer of the leadership, should be on the ball. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The early church won hugely because there was no weak link among the, the membership. Acts chapter 5 verse 12 through 14 says, Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join, <laughs> join them. But the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. Our job as ministers of the word is to bring every member to maturity in Christ. We, what we expect of a pastor... What we expect of a pastor should be what we expect of each member. In the New Testament church, there is no demarcation between the clergy and the lady. All are living stones in the house of our God. Therefore, the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Two qualities require a post Gilgal believer required of a sorry two qualities required of a post Gilgal believer are that he knows his God and he could do exploits. In my experience the most practical way to learn how to walk with God and get to know him close up is to live by faith. Living by faith in its simplest form is looking to the Lord as your financial source. Obviously this is not for everyone, but everyone should trust in the Lord for something essential at one time or another. There are certain experiences with God that set you up on a higher spiritual plane for life. For me, learning to live by faith was one of them. I will firstly introduce this subject through the testimonies of a giant of faith, and later I will share my own insight. Reese Howells is my obvious choice. I attended the Bible college he founded in Swansea, Wales in 1962. Mr. Reese, standing in the K. Mr. Reese Howells and his wife had to go to London because they were going to sail from there to Africa to be missionaries. They had been given money by the mission to pay the expenses to London, but they needed to use it to buy supplies for the trip to Africa. So when they got to the train station, they didn't have money to pay for their train tickets to London. People came to see them off, but everybody thought they were well supplied with money for train tickets. So nobody knew the inward struggle they were having with wondering how they would get tickets for the train or how they would get onto the train without tickets. The Holy Spirit had told them to never make their needs known to people, but to trust him to get the provision to them. They had 10 shillings which was enough to get them to the next station, but not enough to get them to London. They went as far as they could with what they had and then their extremity would be God's opportunity. They had to change trains at Yanelli Station, about 20 miles from their home, and wait there a couple of hours. So without letting anyone know they only booked as far as that. Many friends went with them as far as Yanelli singing all the way and Reese had the thought, I'd sing better if I had the money. They went to eat with some friends at Yanelli but still didn't tell anyone of their need. They went back to the station and waited for the, for the train and for God to provide the money for the train. The time came for, for the train to come in and 
they still didn't have the money. The spirit broke. The spirit spoke to Reese and asked what he would do if he had the money, and he replied that he would stand in the K to buy a train ticket. So the spirit told him to go ahead and get in line. Here's the way the spirit said to him. Said it to him. Well, are you not preaching that my promises are equal to current coin? You had better take your place in the K. So there was nothing he could do except except obey. Reese Howell describes what happened next. There, there were about a dozen people before me there. They were passing by the booking office one by one. The devil kept telling me, now you have only a few people in front of you and when your turn comes, you'll just have to walk through. You have preached about much about Moses and the Red Sea in front of the Egyptians behind, but now you are the one who is shut in. Yes, shut in, I answered. But like Moses, I'll be gloriously led out. When there were only two before me, a man stepped out of the crowd and said, I'm sorry I can't wait any longer, but, I'm, but I must open my shop. He said goodbye and put 30 shillings in my hand. It was most glorious and only a foretaste of what the Lord would do in Africa if we would obey. After I had the tickets, the people who came with us to the train began to give gifts to us. But the Lord had held them back until we had been tested. We were singing all the way to London. Proving God's faithfulness in the area of finance may be small, but it carries a lot of weight. When you need money for food, transport, house rent, running a car or other necessities of life, the problem is very straightforward. It is either you have or you don't have it. It is a very practical demonstration of an answer to prayer. With money, especially money, you need immediately. It is no use declaring, I believe I have it. Either you have it or you don't when you have to, to settle a bill or at the supermarket checkout. When I was at the Bible College of Wales intercessory prayers, for revival and for divine intervention on the world stage were things that both students and staff did every did weekday, morning and evening. It was tempting for one to feel pious and dedicated if you are part of such regular prayer meetings. However, we were often brought down to earth by our lecturers who insisted we take a logical view of prayer. It is no use, they taught, to believe your prayers for revival or divine intervention in a crisis on the other side of the world if you have no practical proof God actually answers your prayers yes collectively the college may be witnessing answers to prayer for world situations we had been praying for sometimes we were asked to pray for money to come in so that the college could pay for the delivery of fuel for our central heating in the kitchen yes these needs were always met, though at times at the deadline. The question remains, however, did my prayers add any value? Was God answering my prayers or was I being carried by the faith and piety of other students and staff? The answer to these questions lies in the next principle we were taught. Prove God's faithfulness for yourself and, you'll, and you will know your prayers and the college prayer meetings are added adding value. Reese Howell proved God in, a, in small as well as big issues. He taught that whenever you think you have the faith for a particular miracle, your faith will always be tested. When God promised Abraham that he and Sarah would bear a child in their old age, he believed even though Sarah laughed it off. For 25 years, Abram not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. 
evidently believing for a son with Sarah when she was past her prime was the easy part. Abram was to face the biggest challenge of his life, the test of faith. God commanded Abram to offer his only son with Sarah as a sacrifice. Normally we expect God to take us to give up something. Normally we expect God to ask us to give up something that is wrong, sinful, or has become an idol to us. Here God was asking Abraham to give the very thing he had given to him. So it was with Reese Howells. The Holy Spirit had dealt with him on many issues. He had given up all ambitions, especially regarding ever calling any money or personal possession his own. He had challenged him to answer the call to the mission field in Africa and leave behind all the comfort and familiar surroundings in the UK. Now, he and his wife were bound for London en route to Africa since he had surrendered everything to follow Jesus. God had promised to supply all his needs, yet his faith will still was still tested. He prayed and received assurance in his heart that all the money needed for the journey to the mission field would come in. So I wonder what he was thinking when on the crucial day when the required sum had not arrived before they left him for the railway station. He, he was being given a very warm send off yet nobody knew he had no money for the train fares beyond Yanelli. People who know their God. Whatever Miss, Mr. Howells was thinking, one thing I know that that happens to people close to the Holy Spirit as he was, he would not be panic, panicking. He wasn't alone. God was with him even when everything else was pointing in the opposite direction. In situations like this, we trust him where we cannot trace him. Reese Howells kept hoping against hope that the money for the train fares would come in the post before they left for the station. It didn't. While hanging around in the station before the train was due to depart, he hoped for a last minute miracle. Nothing. Then came this. The spirit spoke to Reese and asked what he would do if he had the money and he replied that he would stand in the K to buy a train ticket. So the spirit told him to go ahead and get in line. It is, it is in situations like this I have learned a vital lesson. Faith is often joined at the hip with obedience. While his faith was being tested, all Reese Howell had to do was to trust and obey. This is not the time to be quoting what a famous preacher said about faith or to be frantically quoting some scriptures promises like a magic bullet. This is the time to hear from God. The miracle done, the more the miracle did come, the money did come, but at the last possible moment, once he passed the test, that God allowed all the people in his farewell party to come forward with gifts. The Lord said, I know my sheep and they hear my voice. Reese Howells had to really know God for him to set out of the house for the station when he didn't have sufficient funds for the journey. He had to be clear in his mind whether it was really the Holy Spirit telling him to join that K. This is the whole point of Gilgal. It is where the individual Christian gets to become a man God can count on. Don't worry about the enemy. Just make sure you keep the captain of the Lord's army in your sight. Whatever he says to you, do it. John chapter 2 verse 5. No church will be stagnant or program bound if ever if every member has a purpose and has a mandate from God. Gilgal video six QR code uh, says while young prior to knowing Jesus the author read the Quran, drank the Quran, and his mother sought all kinds of power to ensure he was protected. At his water baptism, he experienced the delivering power of Jesus.